conversation, but I know that you're all here. At least everybody, this is the airline check. There's some students who are still wondering, what's going on in the room today? Well, we have Dana Joy speaking to us on poetry and the Catholic imagination. And we'll introduce Dana in, in a few minutes here, but I wanted to uh, say a welcome on behalf of the Boston College Libraries. Uh, my name is Christian DuPont, and I'm one of the uh, associate university librarians here. So on behalf of all of our staff, uh, welcome on this uh, family weekend. I think there's some families here. Uh, at least with my staff, I see people here, which is great. And uh, lots of students, so thank you for coming this afternoon. And uh, this is informal. Please feel free as, as you um, uh, want something else to drink or eat, to get up, move around, okay? People might be coming in, including the bookstore. I don't know what happened, but they're, uh, they should be on their way with some copies of Dana's books. If not, we'll give information about how to get, of course, where they are online, even at doingthejoy.com, right? So, <laughs> sorry for that little bitch, Dana. We'll check with the bookstore. Um, but I also wanted to say uh, there's some sponsorship putting these events together. It's Dana's first time at Boston College. We're very excited. So uh, looking to colleagues in the English department uh, for their sponsorship. And James Najarian is here as a member of the English department, but also as the editor of the Religion and Arts Journal. And uh, so thank you, James, and Religion and Arts for sponsorship as well. Uh, this has been a true sponsorship uh, with the uh, church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. So I'm looking at Karen Kiefer, and then there's, okay, and, uh, and Ellen, Eileen is there, and Lynn, okay, good, so, and Andrew, so thank you. This has been really fun to put together this event, and I know that you've been looking forward to it as much as I have. Um, so, um, to introduce Dana, uh, this, was, this was really difficult, because we have uh, quite a number of really great and not just the English department, I'm looking at Stephen Sturge, who's my colleague here in the Boston College Library, you blush and say that, you know, uh, well-published poet, but then I'm sitting next to him, Andrew Soper, who else we got to about? James, I've already mentioned. I don't see if I see Elizabeth Matson here, or Elizabeth Graver's on me, but we have, you know, a number of people. Um, and Alison Adair, uh, who actually is the one, when it came to drawing the straws, the shorter or the longer straw? I think the longer one, okay? So she got the prize here. So sorry, Andrew, we got Allison up here. Why Allison? Okay, well, um, because Allison uh, has been anthologized. That's one good reason by Dana. Uh, and I think she might mention in some of her remarks that among Dana's um, many uh, leading roles in, in, the, in, the, in the world of, of poetry is, is, is uh, putting together anthologies and prizes. And so selected one of Allison's poems for the 2018. Um, Best American Poetry uh, uh, volumes when you did that. So, and then uh, Kevin Tuxins, I know that you've recently done on your own podcast, Allison, a nice interview in the last few weeks with Dana. Um, and uh, so that's great. I've been picking up. So that's where you, you drill the long straw. And of course, Allison's, uh, you know, has the, the poetry credentials to do this as well. Her um, uh, first book, the uh, the Clearing Half, is one. Uh, the Matt Ritko Prize, the Milkweed, and Pushcar Prizes, so she's got the credentials. So with that, let me get out of the way and have Allison give a warm introduction to Dana, and again, thank you all for being here. Enjoying the event, but we got to celebrate the beauty here too. Um, thank you to Christian. Thank you to all of the um, sources that have funded this event, and all those of you who were here last night as well for the fabulous celebration we had. And thank you to Dana. I did not know that this was your first time at Boston College. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you to you who have made time for this this afternoon. This really stimulating topic. Um, I have the honor of introducing Dana Joya, but first I'm going to tell you about Sister Alfreda, your first grade teacher, um, and I don't think you'll mind this. Sister Alfreda had a skin condition on her palms, which would have been the last thing any of us at age six would have related to. They were red and raw, and she would hold them up at the front of the room and say this is what she was bearing for Christ, like in the middle of our math worksheets. <laughs> so it was, it was a, quite a scene. This was Gettysburg that I lived in, and for field trips, she would walk us through town to various Civil War sites. One in particular was the Jenny Wade House. Now, at the time, Jenny Wade was uh, known as the only civilian to have died during the three-day Battle of Gettysburg. Now we know a few others. 
Um, but she had come up from the cellar mid-battle in order to bake bread for her family and for some of the soldiers, and a bullet came through, it was right along the battlefield, and a bullet came through the wooden front door and pierced her, and she died. So Sister Alfredo walked us down to the hole in the door and encouraged all of us to put our tiny fingers into the hole and through the hole, and I feel like the Catholics in the room will <laughs> identify with this. Um, I can still feel it. I still remember how it felt and how many other people, um, that I wasn't just feeling the hole in the history, that I was feeling the accumulation of all the other people who had touched it when I put my finger through it. Um, so maybe Sister Alfredo was my first poetry teacher, teaching me one of the most important lessons about being a writer and a Catholic, which could be called metaphor, of course, but which is really the idea that everything, everything is more than it seems. Every person and every object is infused with an intangible, what, I don't know, story, value, or grace, something worth reaching for, worth trying to touch. In an interview craftily titled Disturbing Arts, Dana Joya articulates this phenomenon, saying, Catholicism is a worldview that encompasses both human existence as well as perception of the eternal. This relationship between the temporal and the eternal, the mystical, the spiritual, returns in his poetry, specifically in one poem, The Stars Now Rearrange Themselves, when he says, another world reveals itself behind the ordinary. Now, to those in this room, I can only imagine that Dana Joya hardly needs a formal introduction. On my way in, I overheard someone say, well, this is a big get. <laughs> so I thought, well, I think the people coming in know who this is. But Dana has published at least six volumes of poetry. I haven't checked since February, so there could be at least three more. Um, this includes 99 poems, new and selected, and this year's wonderful Meet Me at the Lighthouse, uh, which I did get a chance to interview him about in February. A wonderful book, as well as several critical collections, among them the notable 20th century American poetics and the much celebrated Ken Poetry Matter, born of the Atlantic cover story of the same name. Dana Joya served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, as the Judge Whitney Professor of Poetry and Public Culture at the University of Southern California, and as the Poet Laureate of California. Dana describes himself as a sinner, a pilgrim, and a poet, and in his words, as the founder of the first Catholic Imagination Conference at USC in 2015, as a kind of holy fool. As one attendee of that conference put it, the Catholic imagination is, yes, sacramental and incarnational, but Dana himself notes that Catholic writing tends to be comic, rowdy, rude, and even violent. His pivotal essay, which he'll be speaking about today, The Catholic Writer Today, encourages Catholic writers to step into their identity and to allow Catholicism's wise, true paradoxes to inform the way they, we, approach their work and the way in which they communicate how spirituality, ritual, counterintuitive, even subversive thinking, and a very real community help them refine and reach for new ideas. As one reviewer, Peggy Ellsberg, who as I understand from her review, also studied at Harvard with Elizabeth Bishop, as Dana did, you might have read in his memoir. Peggy Ellsberg says of the collection that grew from Dana's seminal essay, for Joya, there is more to contemporary Catholicism than sociopolitics. By, by Catholic, for example, he means not only the immigrant peasant religion that many of us in Joya's generation inherited, but an assumption that there is a shareable language that transcends words. In Joya's work, small manifestations of higher meaning sunder time, like a breaking and entering of the divine into the earthly, like a blade of lightning harvesting the sky, from Dana's poem prayer. In the essay, Poetry as Enchantment, he explains that in creative realm, Catholicism foregrounds the larger human purposes of the art, which is to awaken, amplify, and refine the sense of being alive. Surely, Dana says it best himself in his poem, which I'm partial to, of course, Pity the Beautiful, with a, with a succinctness which is the imperative of poetry. Pity the night the stars lose their shine. Welcome, Dana Joya. Um, it was a poem in itself at times. Uh, I'm going to 
jump around today because I want to cover a, a bunch of subjects. Um, I want to uh, really do three things. I want to talk about how I came to sort of understand what it meant to be a Catholic poet. Um, secondly, I want to talk about, you know, why that actually has an importance that isn't merely personal or isn't, you know, merely uh, important to a small subculture of poets. And then I'm, I'm going to read, you know, uh, about a half dozen poems, and then we could do questions if there are questions. Um, I want to uh, say what a pleasure it is uh, to be here in the company of so many poets, most of whom have been named, not uh, Richard uh, Dye, who was also a fellow student of Robert Fitzgerald and Elizabeth Bishop uh, at Harvard, but most importantly, is still in the presence of Rena Espaillat, uh, you know, uh, who we uh, paid homage to, I think, uh, as well as just expressed our affection yesterday. There is, even if my books never arrive, on the table there, a beautiful broadside of one of her poems that is free. Please uh, take a copy on your way out. It's something that, you know, uh, the poem is lovely, as is the broadside. The books have arrived. Oh, okay. <laughs> That will be my, in case I'm ever uh, nominated for sainthood, that will be the first miracle. Um, but I feel confident today because it's the feast of my patron saint, Saint Michael. I am, uh, as almost every male in my family, named Michael. Uh, Michael Dana Joya. So, Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protector against the wickedness and snares of the devil. That will be my, my text today. Uh, uh, I guess looking at my life, you'll see a lot of the wickedness and snares of the devil, but I won't get into those this morning. Uh, I am a working class kid from the bad part of Los Angeles. Um, my dad is Sicilian, my mom is Mexican. I had immigrant families on both sides. Actually, the Mexicans got here a little before the Italians. Um, and my father, when I grew up, was a cab driver. My mom was an operator that uh, did the night shift at the phone company. I was the first person in my family uh, to go to college. I never knew any adult male uh, in our social circle that had ever gone to college. I mean, that was with the dentist and the doctor and the, uh, the priest in his own, uh, own way had gone to. Uh, and so I, I was really raised outside of intellectual life, but I knew from a very early age that I was drawn to music, I was drawn to poetry, I was drawn to, to books. I uh, uh, was delighted to know that one of the parents here, who was for Parents Week, who is at the audience, is Sam Weller, the biographer of Ray Bradbury. Uh, I think Sam and I probably both read uh, Ray in, you know, in childhood, and I didn't, you know, uh, and it was part of our imaginative world. Uh, I was lucky uh, in the I recognized my vocation early. You know, I sort of didn't know what I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a musician. Uh, I even thought for a while I wanted to be a priest, but I realized that I, you know, I wanted to be to have a wife and kids, and uh, you know, more than I than I uh, wanted that. I probably would have been a terrible priest. Uh, but about at the age of 20, uh, I was actually living in Austria at the time. I literally woke up one day. And to my own surprise, I knew that I would be a poet. Uh, and it seems very odd to say this, but it's true. I did not choose being a poet. It was a given. It was there. And it was, uh, as Catholics understand, a vocation. Uh, one could have wondered whether it was a delusion, but since 52 years have gone by, and I've never once wavered from that vocation, you know, I, I, I think it was uh, indeed true. My critics might say otherwise, um, but it was, it took me, I knew what I wanted to be, I had not any idea what it meant. I didn't know what it meant to be a poet, except you know, somehow it was about writing poetry, I didn't know what I was going to do for a living, you know, so it was a vague thing and I began to follow it. So I suggest each of you do, if destiny seizes you, just go with it. Seneca the Roman philosopher and dramatist said, if you resist 
uh, your fortune, it drags you behind it. If you follow it, it guides you. And po poetry then determined my life. And I uh, ended up, you know, going to, uh, you know, through studying literature at Stanford, I went to Harvard Graduate School thinking I would be a professor because what does a poet do? A poet becomes a professor. But I realized that really wasn't what I, I didn't want to be a professor. I wanted to be a writer. I ended up in business, in corporate life. Uh, and if you take me to about the age of 35, um, I'm a businessman during the day. I'm writing poetry and essays at night. I am actually very successful in both careers. But I realize that I don't have a home. I don't have a home as a writer, as a poet. Uh, academia didn't feel to me like the right home for me. And, and uh, uh, business was a way of making a living, but it was never, never a home. Uh, and I also realized that I was a Catholic. Uh, and I would have said to myself, I'm a writer who is Catholic versus being a Catholic writer. I didn't think of myself as a Catholic writer because when I read Catholic poetry uh, in those, you know, contemporary Catholic poetry in those few places that published it, it struck me as more Catholic than poetic a lot of times. A lot of it was very pious. Uh, a lot of it was Catholic subject matter. But they, the poet hadn't found the language, you know, think of, compared to Hopkins, which makes the religious experience feel immediate, irresistible, and credible. And so I didn't see much of a, a model there. I knew that if I went to a place, I ne I've never been to Boston College uh, before yesterday. But I knew there were places like Boston College, like Notre Dame, where there was a Catholic studies department. There were people that were uh, committed to both religion and poetry. But it was also obvious that it was a kind of closed conversation <coughs> that wasn't engaged in the broader culture. Uh, and this went on. And the other thing I began to realize is even though I didn't write poems that were specifically Catholic, if you read them, you could feel a Catholic worldview, a Catholic moral view behind them. Um, and uh, I mean, I wasn't planning on reading this poem, but since Allison quoted it, um, I'm going to, this is an early poem of mine. It's called, The Stars Now Rearrange Themselves. Uh, uh, and it's a poem that, you know, I published and it's, Whenever people want to describe my work, this is the poem they seem to go to. Uh, I would never have predicted that. A poet never has any idea whether you know a poem is working or not. But I'll just read you. It was part of a thing called daily horoscopes. And if, you, if, you, if you're old enough like me, and there was a daily horoscope column in the newspaper. It was always in the second person, and it would tell you what was going to happen today. And so I thought it would be, that was an interesting uh, point of view to write a poem. Very short poem. It's to think of a horoscope, looking at the stars, the stars are going to, the pattern of the stars is going to determine the future. The stars now rearrange themselves above you, but to no effect. Tonight, only for tonight, their powers lapse, and you must look toward Earth. There will be no comets now, no pointing star to lead where you no, you must go. Look for smaller signs instead, the fine disturbances of ordered things, when suddenly the rhythms of your expectation break, and in a moment's pause, another world reveals itself behind the ordinary. And one small detail out of place is enough to let you know a missing ring, a breath, a footfall, a sudden breeze, a crack of light beneath a darkened door. Now, the Irish priests of my childhood would have condemned that poem immediately because it somehow referred to horoscopes, which was a kind of devilry. And uh, if this poem wasn't in itself a, a mortal sin, it was at least a venial one. Uh, but I look at it now, and it seems to me essentially Catholic, because 
What is the Catholic imagination? The Catholic imagination is to see everything simultaneously twice. Uh, we are in the temporal world, but we're aware of the eternal. We live in the visible world, but we feel the invisible world really at the margins of our sensations. Uh, we live in our mortality. We aspire to our immortality. And you look at this poem, and it's about you know, being in the ordinary world, but always feeling the presence of something imminent you know, that's in a world beyond ourselves. So, it, it, and it's not the stars that do it, although they, the Horace, uh, you know, scope promises it is. It's something beyond our control, beyond our complete comprehension, which we feel always to be real as a presence in our life. Uh, that's about as Catholic as you get, I think, you know, without, you know, bringing St. Michael the Archangel in. Um, and so, as I went, on, um, I didn't quite know what to do with it. I was quite successful as a poet. I created a conference uh, in Westchester, Pennsylvania. That's where Rena and I became uh, such good friends. Uh, that's where uh, uh, Michael Astrew and I, you know, uh, became friends, and uh, where I first met Alfred and Nicole. And it was, and I noticed that a lot of the people in this conference were believers. Uh, you know, and, and they were drawn to the conference because when I created it, I said I didn't want it to be like a typical conference. You know, if you think of a bread loaf, you have a table that only the writers can sit at, the other table the uh, fellows can sit at, and then the scholarship students have to wait on the tables. That's the classic structure of a university. Uh, and any graduate assistant knows it. Uh, and I, I wanted to create a thing where we were all equal. And so I modeled it after Augustine's city of God. Uh, that, you know, we live in the city of man, but, but we have aspirations of a different kind of world where a different set of rules are followed. So I tried to create a conference. I didn't, was never explicit about this, but it was absolutely Augustinian in that for the, the four or five days of the conference, we were in the bohemian neighborhood, the slum of the city of God. And we treated each other as equals. Everyone who came to that conference, which was intellectually demanding in every other respect, felt that and felt at home. And so our real problem was everybody came back year after year after year after year because it became, in a sense, one of the centers of their life. And as Rena was mentioned yesterday, there was no one, almost no one who went there who didn't feel it changed their lives. And so, right now, I'm in my 50s. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. I go through those uh, eight years. I saved the NEA, which is, was slated for destruction. Um, and I, I came back to California. Uh, I, was, I had to pay to, uh, two sons way through private colleges. Uh, one of whom decided it was it was great to take extra years <laughs> and, and flunk a lot of courses and things like that. Um, that was my Harvard son who was uh, was asked to leave after a year and take some time off. Um, and so I had to pay those bills, and so I took a job at USC. And when I was there, I began to think, well, okay, I'm now 60. What do I want to do at this stage in my life? I've been in, involved in public life. You know, for you know, for years, and I felt that in, order, in addition to writing my own poetry, uh, and that, and at the same time I was elected uh, or chosen as poet laureate of California, so I was trying to reach all the small, you know, all, visit all 58 counties of California. I felt that what I was being asked to do was to help revive Catholic literary life, which was in a very sorry state. I think most Catholic writers felt that. Uh, uh, if they were in a secular university or their secular thing, they had to almost hide their faith. And if they were in a religious school, they didn't feel the, a connection to a broader literary life. And so uh, I created the first Catholic Literary Imagination Conference. But before I did it, I wrote an essay, which some of you perhaps have read, called The Catholic Writer Today. And like Can Poetry Matter, it begins with a cultural paradox. And the paradox is this. Catholics comprise the largest religious group in the United States. Uh, you know, Catholics are uh, roughly 
twice the size of the, uh, of the closest uh, Protestant uh, denomination. Uh, we come out of, <coughs> in some ways, the central intellectual tradition of the Western world, yet in the United States, and this is in the early 20, 21st century, we have almost no positive presence in intellectual and artistic life. You know, uh, Catholic uh, works of art are almost thought of as automatically as historical. Well, we read Dante, uh, we read Hopkins, but you know, that, that was the past, and we're now in a secular culture. And I compare this in a funny way to, to the mid-century, which is 70 years ago. In 1950, you could not have described American literature without describing Catholics. Who are, you know, who are the major writers? Are people like Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy. You go into England, it's Evelyn Waugh, Muriel Spark, Graham Greene. You have you know, poets who you know, uh, publicly convert to Catholicism, like you know, Robert Bowl or Alan Tate. And uh, you, you, know, you have this whole generation that's at midterm. And if you look at the winners of the Pulitzer Prize, the winners of the National Book Award, uh, and that thing, there's a, 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 you know, an astonishing number of not just Catholics, but practicing Catholics, not people that are you know, being cradled. Uh, and that's completely gone now. In fact, uh, there, there are one or two famous writers who are Catholic, but Toni Morrison, Tobias Wolf, but they basically don't admit that in public because they feel that it, you know, it won't do them any good. So I felt that maybe it was time to create a home. Now, the, the, this, people, you know, the, the, my, my essay appeared, it, it had a huge effect, huge, it was translated into other languages, letters, there was people, you know, arguing about it. Why was it so good? Well, I would like to say it's my genius. Uh, I would also admit that the problem was so obvious any fool could have talked about it. But the reason that the essay got good is I gave it as a, I give it as a lecture, and then I talked to the audience. And they asked me questions, you know. And every time I, I did this, I would rewrite it. And, I, and, the, and the questions the people brought to me, I said the the essay has to answer. And so that went on. And people said, "We well, should publish it, publish it." And I said, "No, no." And and so I, what I think I was eventually doing, I guess I created an articulate communal response of this is how Catholic writers, intellectuals were feeling about this increasingly anti-Catholic moment in American culture and intellectual life. Now, uh, I'm not a Catholic triumphalist. Uh, you know, I don't want to be like Isabel and Ferdinand and, you know, plant the cross, you know, on the country, you know, and, and expel the Moors, from, you know, from Spain. Uh, uh, but I have a, a, a much simpler notion, which is to say, what is culture? What is literature? Culture is a conversation. And it's wonderful because we can go fa so far back in Western culture where we have our foundational philosopher, Socrates, who couldn't read or write. He conversed with people and believed that out of that conversation, you can't come to truth, but you can approximate it. You can get closer than you were. But my aspiration was very simple. In the culture, that is American, uh, excuse me, in, in the conversation that is American culture. And, and uh, I say this with all sincerity and with sadness and respect. You know, as chairman of the NEA, I heard daily the culture that is American, uh, the conversation that is American culture. It's lost, it's angry, it's depressed, uh, it's become unhealthy. And, I felt that both for the general culture of the United States and for the, the specific culture of American Catholics, we had to reopen the conversation uh, between Catholicism and the broader culture, uh, between our sense of, the, of a uh, transcendental mode of existence and an increasingly unhappy secular view of the world. Uh, if we made that, that culture lively uh, and engaged, it would improve both 
Catholic literature and American literature. It would improve both the Catholic arts, because what I'm talking about in terms of poetry, in terms of literature, uh, is true of each and every one of the arts. It would, it would, would broaden this, because even if, if you're entirely secular in your perspective, it helps to, in a sense, to have to engage and account for uh, the transcendental longings that are universal in humanity. Uh, we did this uh, this conference. I had no money at all. Uh, I, I got a couple of rooms from USC. I didn't even tell them what I was using them for. I got a priest that I knew to help me. And we began inviting people uh, and sitting there. And we figured out how much it would cost. He says, how much do you have of that? I said, well, I made a personal contribution of 2000 the year before. And I said, if worst comes to worst, I'll pay the bill myself. Uh, but I believed in divine providence. And I believed that if we were doing the right thing, it would happen. And sure enough, people came forward. They just, as soon as they found out about it, they came forward and asked how they could help. Uh, in some cases, I had to argue with them for you know for hours in terms of to help the way we needed it, not the way they wanted us to. Uh, but we ended up with actually more money than, than it took. We've created the conference uh, again uh, in New York, in Chicago, in Dallas, and next fall uh, it will be bigger than ever at Notre Dame. Uh, it, you know, we had a thousand people come in Chicago. Most of them established writers editors and critics. And I've already begun in a sense to see the, the, the difference it made. Uh, so I say this all simply to invite you to step forward in your own culture, to become part of that conversation. Uh, you know, come to the, to the next uh, gathering in Notre Dame. But if nothing else to think about it, because um, I think it helps to have a home, to be in a place where you can, because it's, it's interesting. I, mean, I, I raised people that didn't speak English. My grandmother, my great aunt, who helped raise me, neither one of them knew how to read or write. Uh, they didn't know English. Uh, and I understand that you can have a certain conversation at home that you can't have in the public square. If you have that conversation at home, if you know who you are, if you know where you're coming from, you're then better able to have that conversation in the public square. So it just really comes down to dialectics. I think the dialectic of American culture has grown lazy, argumentative, angry, polarized. And I do believe that as Catholics, uh, we can create a conversation not based on anger, not based on, on uh, the rhetoric of power uh, and this, but a, but a, a conversation based on love, on inclusivity and gratitude. Catholicism is a universal religion. All are, you know, are basically called. Uh, and the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. The rules of the world are not the, uh, the rules that inform our vision. I think, if nothing else, that perspective is something that the United States needs right now. Uh, because it's certainly, uh, I don't certainly you know, hear it <laughs> on a daily basis. Here ended the sermon. I'm gonna read now half a dozen poems, uh, which I think in one way or another, even though until the very end, there's I'm, I'll only, I, I guess I'll have two that are kind of explicitly Catholic, uh, uh, where I think, you know, what, what we're, I'm talking about become, become evident. The first, uh, I was for years attacked because I, for my sonnets and my villanelles. I felt that was a great distinction because I had never published a sonnet or a villanelle. Uh, but they knew I was a formalist, so they figured I must be writing sonnets and villanelles. Um, and so Bill Baer, who uh, was one of Rena's champions, I believe, early on, uh, had a bump magazine called The Formalist, and he always was asking me for a moment. <laughs> Poem. So he said, do you have anything? I said, well, I got one poem. And I noticed it was 13 lines long, and it wasn't finished. And so I said, figured, well, I could make Bill happy, and I could be good to my enemies, because I think you have to forgive your enemies by publishing a song. Uh, it has one of the oldest metaphors in literature, which is the road as the journey of life. 
the road. He sometimes felt that he had missed his life by being far too busy looking for it. Searching the distance, he often turned to find that he had passed some milestone unaware, and someone else was walking next to him. First friends, then lovers, now children and a wife. They were good company, uh, gen generous, kind, but equally bewildered to be there. He noticed then that no one chose the way. All seemed to drift by some collective will. The path grew easier with each passing day because it was worn and mostly sloped downhill. The road ahead seemed hazy in the gloom. Where was it he had meant to go? And with whom? Now, if you, uh, it's interesting, in um, a secular culture, if you go to the art museums, most of the art before the, say the mid 19th century is religious. Uh, but it's been taken out of its religious context and made into an aesthetic object. And so those things which were created for devotion, uh, you know, are now seen as essentially as uh, objects of design. Uh, and this is uh, about one of those museums. Uh, in Boston, I, I probably need to explain this, not to Rena, but to the others. Do you know what a santo is? Uh, in South, in Central America, the Southwest, when Catholicism came there, people were poor. They didn't have money for statues and for art, which had to be imported from Europe. And so in, in uh, basically, you know, Latin America, they had local, uh, you know, woodsmiths basically carve, you know, statues uh, out of whatever the native wood was, and they would put in the church. And they're, they're all anonymous. Uh, they're rather fragile because they're, you know, they're made by wood. And, and I find them beautiful. And this is just about a santo in a museum. It's of an angel. We'll make him St. Michael because it's his feast day. Uh, and he's been damaged. Uh, in this case, damaged in the Mexican Revolution, you know, when Catholicism was made illegal and, and the churches were, you know, were looted and vandalized. And this is spoken by the angel in the museum. Called the angel with the broken wing. I am the angel with the broken wing, the one large statue in this quiet room. The staff finds me too fierce, and so they shut faith's ardor in this air-conditioned tomb. The docents praise my elegant design above the chatter of the gallery. Perhaps I am a masterpiece of sorts, the perfect emblem of futility. Mendoza carved me for a country church. His name's forgotten now, except by me. I stood beside a gilded altar where the hopeless offered God their misery. I heard their women whispering at my feet, prayers for the lost, the dying, and the dead. Their candles stretched my shadows up the wall, and I became the hunger that they fed. I lost my left wing in the revolution. Even a saint can savor irony. When troops were sent to vandalize the chapel, they hit me once, almost apologetically. For even the godless feel something in a church, a twinge of hope, fear, who knows what it is a trembling unaccounted by their laws, an ancient memory that they can't dismiss. There is so much I must tell God. The howling of the damned can't reach that high, but I stand here like a dead thing nailed to a perch, a crippled saint above a painted sky. Um, my mother, I wrote one poem about my mother uh, in my first book, 
After which she informed me that if I wrote her for another poem about her, she'd kill me. <laughs> and she was a woman worthy of that threat. Uh, she would hit me for any reason, uh, even in adulthood. You know, you know, uh, and but after you know she um, she died, you know, a couple of years, I felt I was safe at least from physical harm. Uh, and, uh, I don't know if any of you have lost, I mean, I know the older people, but we've lost our parents. And one of the sad things, actually, a week ago I helped a woman clear out the, the apartment of, of this um, man who had been my Latin teacher in high school. You, you have to take all their stuff. And you don't know what to do with it. I mean, you don't want to throw anything out. And it's a very, very uh, difficult emotional thing. And this is about uh, me saving the, the really very cheap, you know, Christmas bulb that my mother had. My mother couldn't buy anything if it wasn't the cheapest. But I just, I couldn't throw them out. My wife has all these beautiful, you know, elegant Christmas things. They're decorating the Christmas trees, you know, this great moment for her. And I'm putting these god-awful things on it. And so it's just about that, that, that experience. There's one word in this poem that uh, you have to be probably above 60 to understand. It's a dime store. This used to be stores, in fact, for my parents, there was, you know, five and dime, you know, it was a store where everything was 10 cents. It's like the dollar store, you know, today. Um, the, the title is a pun. Uh, if you remember the mag guy brought three gifts to the Christ child, uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This poem is called Tinsel, Frankincense, and Fur. It's F-I-R, fur tree. Hanging old ornaments on a fresh cut tree, I take each red glass bulb and tin foil serif and blow away the dust. Anyone else would throw them out. They are so scratched and shabby. My mother had so little joy to share. She kept it in a, in a box to hide away. But on the darkest winter night, Voila, she opened it resplendently to shine. How carefully she hung each thread of tinsel, or touched each dime store bauble with delight. Blessed by the frankincense of fragrant fur, nothing was too small to be loved. Why did the dead insist on bringing gifts we can't reciprocate. We wrap her hopes around the tree, crowned by a fragile star. No holiday is holy without ghosts. Um, three more poems. Uh, two of them sort of short, but this is, uh, well, let me do a short one first, then I'll do the, the longer one. My wife and I lost our first son when uh, he was four months old. And if you've ever lost a child, and I hope no one else here has, uh, there's a very weird thing that happens, is the child doesn't go away. You simply see him or her in other kids. And so I would see some other child, who I realized would be about the same age as my, my, my son, and I said, you yeah, know, that's what he'd be doing now. On his, so on his 21st birthday, I wrote him this poem. He was named Michael too. Majority. Now you'd be three, I said to myself, seeing some child born in the same summer as you. Now you'd be five, or seven, or 10. I watched you grow in foreign bodies leaping into a pool, all laughter, or frowning over a keyboard, but mostly just standing taller each time. How splendid your most mundane actions seemed in these joyful proxies. I often held back tears. Now you are 21. Finally, it makes sense that you have moved away 
into your own afterlife. Um, one of the things I, I don't know if I prided myself on, but I always thought it was the, the most important, not a, that it was an important distinction, because I'd never written a poem about the Virgin Mary. Which I think is, you know, the, the great danger of all Catholic poets. That's when you sort of know you've gone over the edge, you know. And, uh, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's been hard for anybody to do a good one since Dante. You know, he, he kind of took the territory. But to my surprise, I found myself writing one a couple of years ago. It just came, and it didn't even start that way. But I was thinking about. I don't think anybody in this room knows who founded Los Angeles. Does anybody know? The second biggest city in the United States, uh, biggest ca uh, Catholic diocese uh, in the Western world. Um, it was a group of 44 families called Los Pobladores. And these were the complete outcasts of, of basically the Spanish Empire in the New World. Um, and the thing that, that they noticed, there was not one of these families that was pure. Uh, every family was a mix of mixed race. Um, and these were the people, and they were given this completely god-awful piece of the real estate. Uh, that was before the boom. Um, and this crummy little river, you know, and that, you know that you, you, probably, you see on TV shows now because it's all cement. <laughs> and so I, I was writing about this, about how the name of Los Angeles even has been forgotten. You know, we call it, you know, Los Angeles, but it's, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's only remember when people talk about the Queen of the Angels. So this is about the founding of Los Angeles, which brings the Virgin into it. And by the, and by the end of the poem, it becomes a sort of prayer to her. And um, it's called, it's one of three psalms that my new book ends up called Psalm to Our Lady, Queen of the Angels. And in each of the poems begins as a song. So I have a, a line, you know, a, a leading line that's uh, from the Psalms. Let us sing to our city a new song, a song that remembers its name and its founders, Los Pobladores, the forgotten 44, who built their pueblo beside a small river. They named the river for the Queen of the Angels, Nuestra Señora Reina de Los Angeles. Poor, they were forced to the margins of empire, dark, dispossessed, not one couple pure. Let us praise the marriages and matings that created us, desire swifter than democracy in merging the races, Spanish, Aztec, African, and Anglo, forbidden marriages made holy by children. I praise myself mutt of mestizo and mezzogiorno, the seed of exiles and violent men, disfigured by their burdens, disfigured by the burdens they shouldered to survive, broken or bent, their boast was their suffering. I praise my ancestors, the unkillable poor, the few who escaped disease or despair, the restless, the hungry, the stubborn, the scarred. Let us praise the dignity of their destitution. Let us praise their mother, Nuestra Senora, the lost guardian who watches them still from murals and medals, statues, tattoos. She has not abandoned her lost, her divided Pueblo. She has been homeless with a hungry child, a refugee fleeing a brutal warlord, a mother. She held her murdered son. Her crown is jeweled with seven sorrows. Pray for the city that lost its name. Pray for the people too humble for progress. Pray for the flesh that pays for the prophet. Pray for the angels kept from their queen. Pray the hour of our death each day in the southern sun of the desecrated city. Pray for us, mother 
of the mixed and misbegotten beside our dry river and the tents of the outcast poor. And then I'd like to end with a love poem. Um, this is a poem to my wife, and it's about, I think, the, the foundation of, of love, of really lasting sexual, marital love, is all talk. It's parlance. It's palaver. Uh, you create a conversation with someone that is unending. And your language wraps around hers, hers around yours, your stories merge, and it's the most intimate form of communication you'll ever have with another human being. The trouble is that it's fragile. If you lose that person, they're the only one that speaks that language. Uh, and and I, there's an implicit metaphor in this poem, which is a kind of very Californian one. In California, there are a few Indian tribes of which there are only one or two native speakers left. And when that person dies, the language dies, the songs die, the dances die. Marriage of many years. Most of what happens, happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin, warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time cannot break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in sovereign secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. Thank you so much. Affinity. And it's about time we had a poet, 
a pope from the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I think he's doing wonderful things, but I also think John Paul II, who, I mean, one of the greatest popes in history, who I think opened the church up, you know, in these ways. And I think it's just an ongoing process. Is that the Catholic Church is the think about this, not in religious terms, but in secular terms. The Catholic Church is the oldest institution in the world. You know, we we see how bad institutions get after 10 years. You know, imagine 2,000. And so I think that, you know, that renewal is the perpetual uh, work of the church. And one hopes that each pope has the vocation for a particular kind of renewal. Clearly, John the 23rd, uh, he did it, Paul VI led the liturgical uh, renewal. Uh, John Paul I didn't, wasn't around long enough to do anything, but John Paul II, I think, you know, you know, uh, you know brought the Eastern and Western churches together. So I think this is a, an ongoing uh, work, and, I, and I'm glad that we finally have somebody from the Western Hemisphere, somebody who sees Rome from the different side. In the same way that uh, John Paul was able to, because he was, you know, the first non-Italian, you know, for I don't know how many centuries that came. It had lived through a different history, so so I think you know we're we're lucky in those things, and and uh, you know I, uh, my own perspective is that it's a cultural perspective. Uh, we cannot expect the church to do the work of culture. That is to be, to be done by artists, by patrons, by audiences, and that is the. The folk, you know, which is not to say that the poets or painters or whatever should be necessarily, you know, focused sacred specialists. But I think we bring a particular kind of energy, perspective, freedom uh, that the organized church cannot have. And I think we'd be fools to wait for the church to lead cultural renewal. If we're lucky, they'll come along with us. And I want that kernel of my question. Have you seen an impact in the? Uh, in well, the well, well, yeah, well, both both John John Paul II was was a poet and a dramatist. Um, uh, Francis is a very serious literary reader and a kind of has kind of an aesthetic streak, and and they've done things, but I don't think you can do it from the Vatican. I really don't, you know. And so they have these, you know. So if you have a, if he calls the artists to, to Rome, who comes? It's the professional Catholic artists or the people that, you know, which, so there are already people too inside the tent in a way. So it's all good. And I think the permission, the, the call that both of those popes have made have given the, the laity, you know, more permission in it. But, but it's going to happen outside the church. Bishops are too busy. They, they're, they're worried about the, the church mortgages and keeping the Catholic schools a thing or the, the lawsuits they're getting. You know, artists are the ones that that understand art. So, you know, so so we, I think it's the, this is the one thing where the, the, the laity needs to lead the church. Uh, because when the church lost beauty, when the church lost the power of architecture, of music, of paintings, of statues, of poetry, they lost one of the main ways, maybe the most important way, in which uh, you know God is heard in the world, and uh, without that, it, it becomes a diminished thing. And I think we we witness that in terms of uh, the current Catholic Church, this one current American Catholic Church. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I know that became Catholic not because of anything, but they went into Chartres and they had a feeling there, they experienced something there that didn't make sense under the rules by which they lived their life. And they wanted to pursue that. I remember one time you tell me that when they heard the Mozart Mass in C minor, <coughs> they said that's where they wanted to be. And it led them to, be, to actually eventually become Catholic. Rina? You know. you think that's true because, because it's the arts that really get into it? Dana, do you think that's true because it's the arts that get into other people's heads and souls? <laughs> Even more than faith, even more than religion, as a, as religion, as a, as a set of rules and rules for living, is it something about art that we can't quite explain, but that gets in where nothing else well, goes? I, I, absolutely, uh, and I, I think that's the thing that we we've forgotten. Is that, I mean, Catholics, you know, 
Catholics have lost an intellectual life, but where do we, we still have the A-team in philosophy and in theology. That's where we can beat, you know, uh, you know, the Big Ten, you know. Um, but it says something about, you know, Catholics have fallen back on our great, our fantastic tradition of argumentation, of analytic philosophy, you know, of apologetics. These are very powerful tools, but I don't think that they bring people necessarily closer to God. They maybe make it easier to talk about it, uh, but people come through experience. And if you read Jean Maritain, he talks about poetic imagination, poetic experience, which is not really just about poetry, but it's about all artistic things, which is to say that you go, through, you can think your way through the world with numbers. Uh, most of you probably spend five minutes of the week doing this, and you hate it, uh, unless you're, you know, you're a scientist or an engineer. Most of the time, we, we think through the world conceptually, logically. That takes up for about 45 minutes of the week. The rest of the time, we're experiencing it holistically. It's an experiential thing where we don't distinguish between the idea, the emotion, uh, you know, these things like this, and it's intuitive. That's how art operates. Art operates in that part of our experience that, that's before logic, before measurement, before all these very useful things that we do as human beings. Uh, something I should have said, this is a subject of an of a essay I wrote that's about to come out of the book called Christianity and Poetry. And it's very simple. Uh, most Catholics don't believe this. In fact, I say 99% of Catholics would disagree with the statement that I'm about to make, which is that you cannot be uh, an alert Catholic without loving poetry. It's, you cannot do it. Um, well, I've been getting along with it without poetry my whole life. <laughs> One third of the Bible is written as poetry. Uh, and so you can say, well, God made a terrible editorial book. <laughs> uh, you know, why didn't he use prose? I mean, ah, the guy, guy's getting old. Um, but what it, if you look at where the Bible uses poetry, it uses it quite deliberately, the prophetic books. Um, what is the beginning of Christian poetry? Christian poetry begins at the first moment that the incarnation goes from mystic knowledge known only to Mary, God, and the angel Gabriel, and she does the visitation, and she tells one of her relations that she's pregnant. And how does she announce it? She goes, she doesn't say, I'm an unmarried mother, you know, but luckily Joseph's going to marry me and I've got this kid on the way. She goes, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoiceth in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. He that is mighty hath magnified me and holy is his name. His mercy is on those who fear him throughout the generations. He hath showeth strength of his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the powerful from their seats. He has exalted the poor and the humble. He hath given the hungry good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. That's a very complicated way of saying you're pregnant. <laughs> But what she is saying is to say that the only way to express religious insight, to express our sense of the eternal, our experience of the invisible, you know, of the divine, is not to use ordinary prose. You know, as Randall Jamel says, prose that cats and dogs can understand. But it's to use, you know, poetry. So the Bible deliberately uses poetry to bring us into proximity of the uh, ineffable power of the divine. And so if you can't get poetry, you really can't get Catholicism, can you? You can't get the central mysteries of this. And so, and so I, I don't think it's incidental. I think it's fundamental to, uh, to this. And when you lose that tradition, you lose your power to articulate what the faith is. Uh, 
Uh, hi, you mentioned a uh, juxtaposition between what feels like a degraded secular culture and the Catholic world. And when I hear secular, the first thing I think of as the opposite is religious, not just Catholic. And it felt like listening to what you had to say that almost all of it would fit for any deep believer who's trying to confront culture uh, with art or with whatever they want to do. And I'm just wondering two things, I guess. What is there a unique slant that the Catholic writer, as opposed to any deeply religious writer, uh, has to deal with? And do you see that, in general, every religious faith may need some of the same endeavors that you've been able to put together in the Catholic world? First of all, I haven't done it. Many of us have done it together. Uh, I think one of the measures of the secular world is that everything has been put in the marketplace. Everything has been commoditized. Uh, everything is, you know, you know, in a sense, has been given a price. Uh, you know, versus a, a vision, you know, which basically says there are things beyond price, uh, that there is a value that's not d denominated. You know, I mean, uh, you know, do you think of the Magnificat? You know, he showed the strength of his arm, he has scattered the proud of the imagination of the hearts, the powerful, he has brought down from their seats, the rich he has sent him to your way. It's a very different thing, you know, than Adam Smith. Uh, whom I admire is getting at. And I believe that the marketplace is wonderful, but all it does is put a price on everything. It puts a value on nothing. Um, all faiths bring this in different ways. Um, I was, once again, I, you know, I gave this as a lecture, this Catholic writer today, and so I got a lot of questions. I have the answer to your yours written in one paragraph. <laughs> so you will, you know, if you'll permit me to read a paragraph of prose. There is no singular and uniform Catholic worldview, but nevertheless, it is possible to describe some general characteristics that encompass both the faithful and the renegade uh, among the literati. Catholic writers tend to see humanity struggling in a fallen world. They combine a longing for grace and redemption with a deep sense of human imperfection and sin. Evil exists, but the physical world is not evil. Nature is sacramental, shimmering with signs of sacred things. Indeed, all reality is mysteriously charged with the invisible presence of God. Catholics also perceive suffering as redemptive, at least when born in emulation of Christ's passion and death. Catholics also generally take a long view of things, looking back to the time of Christ and the Caesars, but also gazing forward towards eternity. The Latinity of the pre-Vatican II Church sustained a meaningful continuity with ancient Rome, reaching even the working class uh, Los Angeles uh, of the 1960s, where I was raised and educated. Catholicism is also intrinsically communal, a notion that goes far beyond sitting at mass with local congregations extending to a mystical sense of continuity between the living and the dead. Finally, there is a habit of spiritual self-scrutiny and moral examination of conscience, uh, one source of the soi-disant Catholic guilt. Now, I think only about half of those things could be said about all religions. Uh, and so, you know, Catholicism shares in a sense that general sense of the transcendent, but it, it takes a particular form, you know, coming out of Christ, you know, uh, his passion, his death, of the, the early apostolic church. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and, and in fact, uh, one of the main uh, issues, I think, for, you know, Catholic and other religions is the whole notion of, of the fallen state of, 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 of humanity. As a particularly Catholic notion. In fact, most, most of the heresies, the other heresy that comes up most often is the notion that the physical world is bad, that somehow the spiritual is, is where Catholicism is an incarnate religion. That's why we get up, we genuflect, we sit, we kneel, you know, we go, you know, you, you, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the mass is a bit like a physical workout, especially when your knees are bad. So maybe one more question. And, and, uh, so. 
let us this together. Thank you very much for your talk. Now, according to old custom, neither I nor all my friends we call ourselves poets, but we try to do a little composition and perform for each other. But a sort of debate has arisen between us about what form, if any, Catholic poetry should take in the modern world. So I have friends who are more, much more in the vein of emulating Hopkins or the high English poetry of the Catholic world in response to sort of degrading of the English language in the modern world. And I have other friends who aren't so concerned about whether we should try to preserve those old traditions, maybe be archaic in that sense. So I was wondering, do you think that Catholic poetry should take any particular form? any particular aesthetic style? Or how, how deep does that go? Uh, well, no, I don't. Um, it's, Catholics see everything as two things at once. And you should, uh, as a poet, you should do the same thing, which is that you, you have your spiritual life, which is it has its own needs, its own directions. It will, it, if, it, if you're lucky, it will take a shape you know, that guides your life and uh, enlarges and uh, enhances your life. On the other hand, you're working as a poet, trying to write poems that work. You know, these things, uh, this is what I'm feeling, because what you're trying to do is, it's what Rita talked about, you're trying to take things that are not ideas, they're not philosophies, they're not ideologies, these invisible, these impulses, and, and find a way of, of making them come alive in language. If you do both of those things separately, they will begin to talk in your unconscious. Because Catholics should also be Freudian. Uh, and the book believe there's a conscious mind and an unconscious mind. There was a, a famous uh, poet named George Sepharides, who won the Nobel Prize in literature as George Sepharis. And he was a diplomat in London. He hadn't written poetry for years and he, he used to visit T.S. Eliot in his office and he said, oh, you know, Mr. Eliot, I have no time to write, I'm unhappy, I'm a failed poet, I'm so busy. And, and Eliot said, you know, calm down. The unconscious is always at work. You know, and the next summer, you know, uh, Seferis took a few weeks and then he wrote the poem that fundamentally won a minimal prize. So you trust your unconscious, you know, look to your soul, work on your writing, and trust your unconscious to connect the two. And the forms that you find in the language that best help you to express what you want to do will be the only and the natural vehicles for your poetry. Uh, well, I'm gonna end that with a six line poem, just so we end on poetry rather than me droning on. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, uh, see if I can remember it, this was originally a 28-line poem, and NPR had asked me for a poem about New Year's, and uh, so I wrote this elegant, uh, I think it was 28-line poem, it was uh, um, recorded, it was broadcast, and then when I got time to publish it, uh, it was just too long. And so I cut it down to 24 lines, then uh, 20 lines, then 18 lines. It never stopped at a sonnet, uh, but it went right to, um, uh, you know, to eight. Then eight was just too wordy. And so I, I ended up with six lines. It no longer has anything at all to do with New Year's. But it's about how most of what we experience in life, nobody else knows. You can take the person you're closest to in the world and you have no idea the fullness of their consciousness or their experience. And I say that as someone who's been married to a woman for 43 years, who I only barely understand. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons I like her so much. Unsaid. So much of what we live goes on inside. The diaries of grief, the tongue-tied aches of unacknowledged love are no less real for having passed unsaid. What we conceal is often more than what we dare confide. Think of the letters that we write our dead. Thank you so much.
Well, let's end it with getting a broadside by Rita Espaillat. If you're lucky, prevail upon her to sign it. Thank you all for coming.